Now, the business impact of artificial intelligence. Um, and our first speaker today with that comes to us from Rapid Miner, and that is Mr. Ralph Klinkenberg. Give him a warm round of applause. How are you? So people are still getting seated. Maybe I use that time to introduce myself. Um, I'm one of the two founders of Rapid Miner. We are a company that uh, implements and develops software for machine learning, predictive analytics, and offers that in different versions. One of them is an open source version, so you can actually download the software for free. But the good thing is today I'm not so much talking about the software or the company. I'd rather focus on example use cases. What can you actually do with artificial intelligence, with machine learning, to create value in the industry? And I give you a bunch of examples for that. And uh, if you have questions afterwards, feel free to ask. Let's start with a little question. Can you predict the future? Who can predict the future? OK, nobody. It's interesting. Um, imagine we are at a reception. Everyone is holding a glass. Luckily, I have one here. And now you see that one of your neighbors is dropping their glass. The interesting thing is you will notice that most people standing around that person and noticing that, they will look a little bit shocked because they will anticipate the glass is probably going to break when it hits the ground. And they do that before it even hits the ground. How can they do that? And, and how can they do it so fast? It typically takes like less than half a second for, for the glass to drop and, and touch the ground. Well, when we were a child and going up, we saw a lot of glasses fall. If the altitude of the fall was high, if the glass is thin and the floor is hard, like stone or marble, it's probably going to break. That's something we learned from that data. If the altitude is not so high, if the glass is thicker and it's maybe a carpet floor, it's probably not going to break. So we had a lot of observations from the past. We could call it data or experience. And then we extracted patterns from that and models that allow us to predict when will glass break or not. It's just a simple example to illustrate that actually, in some cases, it's possible to predict the future. If there are some physical laws or other circumstances that give clues why things might happen or not happen. So it's all about finding patterns, using these patterns to create explanations, find correlations, um, or use predictions to actually improve what you're doing. It can be, for example, predictive medicine, predicting that a pro pe uh, person will have an issue before the issue even occurs, and maybe preventing this critical issue. There's different types of analytics that people look at. Um, the first one is a look in the rear view mirror. It's called business intelligence. You look what has happened in the past. How much of product A did I sell in a certain store B? Then the next step is explaining why did it actually happen? Why did I sell more of this product in one unit than another one? Then the next step is actually trying to predict how much of that product am I going to sell? What's the demand of that? And then forecast that. But all this insight isn't really valuable if you don't derive any actions. If you do the same thing you did before without that knowledge, you didn't really create any value. You just know more, but you didn't act. So what really makes it valuable is the action you take. And that's sometimes called prescriptive analytics. Letting the computer give you recommendations, give forecasts and recommendations. What should I do? What should I recommend to this customer so that he buys something? Or that I maximize my revenue, um, and so on. Let's skip this one. Um, and now let me start with all the different use cases. This is one from the utility industry. Imagine you're selling electricity or gas or something else. You have a lot of customers. And then you observe that a certain percentage of your customers churns. They go to another company that buys the services somewhere else. Some people have mobile phone contracts for two years. And when they, the two years are over, maybe they just let it automatically renew. Or maybe they uh, go somewhere else because a new company offers them a free phone or something like that. And the question now is, Who's going to churn? Who's going to stay? And if someone is going to churn, it would be better for me to make him a better deal, because earning less with his customer is still better than earning nothing with him. This is just one example. Another example, if you go into a bookstore, and the bookstore doesn't have a book in store, they will order it for you. Now, there's a company called Libri. It's one of the biggest book retailers worldwide. And they deliver the books to the bookstores if they are out of store. 
And um, if a customer comes to the bookstore and the book is not in store, then this company gives a guarantee to the bookstore. If you order by 5 p.m., you have the book next morning, so you can give it to your customer. To be able to give that guarantee to the bookstores, they have to predict very precisely for each title how often will it be sold in each region so they can have it on stock and deliver it to the bookstore in time. So they do it for any kind of book. And they also give recommendations to the bookstores which books to place in the shelves and how to place them and where to place them in the store to maximize sales. It's good for the bookstore because they sell more, but it's also obviously good for the retailer because they uh, are serving all the bookstores. Other examples are in the aviation industry. You book a flight, most people book uh, economy class, and then sometimes you wonder, well, business class is too expensive, but what if, if the airline offered you, well, it's just 50 euros more and you can uh, fly business, uh, business class or first class. Um, a lot of passengers would do that. And the thing is, it doesn't make the flight any more expensive for the airline. You still have the same weight, the same luggage, so they don't burn more fuel. You just have a more comfortable seat. And if you're willing to upgrade and pay a little, they actually earn more. The question is, whom should I make this offer to so um, I can leverage that potential? Another application is um, predicting the arrival time of the plane when it leaves the ground. Let's say you want to fly from Frankfurt to New York. As soon as the plane goes off in Frankfurt, they already estimate when it will arrive in, in, uh, in New York. Obviously, they have their schedule, but do you know if they will keep it? Depends on a lot of things. For example, the wind. If you have headwind, you'll be slower. If you have the, the wind supporting you from the back, then you will be faster. Depends on the traffic in New York. If there's a lot of planes you, in the waiting list, you may have to fly loops, and then you get delayed when, when the plane goes down uh, on the airport. So the question is, when does it really arrive, and will my passengers make it to the connecting flight? How much time do they have? And if you realize, well, it's not enough time for them to make it by going through the whole airport, but it would be enough time if a car picks them up at the one plane and drives them to the other plane, then maybe that's what you do. You tell the passenger on the plane, hey, we're a little bit late, you can still make your flight, but we have to offer you a um, chauffeur service, and then they'll take you to the plane. It's good for the customer because they make their connection, they're happy, and it's good for the air company because the airline doesn't have to pay a replacement ticket for the next flight. Another application that you have in the airplane industry, but you also have it in automotive industry or in, in manufacturing, is called predictive maintenance. Predicting a machine failure before it even happens so that you can prevent it. What happens if the machine fails? The whole production line has to stop. The people working on the production line can't do anything. You lose a lot of money. Also, you get into trouble because you cannot keep up the, the amount of pro produced product that you need to deliver and that you promised to deliver. So there's all kinds of trouble you go into if the machine breaks. So the idea is you analyze the data of machines. You observe sometimes they break. And then the, the machine learning algorithms tell you in advance, in the future, OK, when I observe this kind of pattern, let's say um, if it's a chemical process, maybe too high temperature, too high pressure, or some vibrations in a machine or something else, then typically, so, so much later, this problem occurs. And you can use that to do the maintenance or to fix a problem before it actually occurs. Going back to the plane, that would mean if I know that the particular part of the plane will be in trouble in, let's say, two weeks, I have enough time to schedule maintenance at which airport is the best time to change the part when it's standing there anyway to unload the passengers. Um, I can make sure the engineer for the replacement is there. I can make sure the replacement part is there. And nobody sees any trouble because it doesn't even happen. You can do that to airplanes, for example, for the very critical parts like the turbines, but even for seemingly not so critical parts like, for example, the coffee machines or the toilets. Because imagine you're on a transatlantic flight and suddenly toilets don't work anymore. You're in deep trouble. <laughs> so there's all kinds of components. The same applies to cars, both the cars on the road as well as the manufacturing of the cars. Because the machines that manufacture the cars, they can break, but the car in operation itself can obviously also break. The interesting thing is when you do predictive maintenance, which kind of data do you use to do these predictions? And where's the information? Obviously. You have sensor data, like I already measured, for example, temperature or pressure or vibrations or audio signals in the case of the industry machines. Um, but then maybe there's more data. If you have IT systems involved, maybe there's log data, there's alarm data, other events. Maybe there's metadata, like when I manufactured this, I had the machine configuration in this way, it was this type of a product. 
Then there's free text information. The operator of the machine may have taken notes. Oh, today in my shift, this problem occurred. I fixed it this and that way. And um, then maybe the next shift, something else happened. And at some point, maybe there's a correlation. Whenever something little happened here, something bigger happened at some point later. So there's also information in unstructured data like text. It's harder to get, but it's actually very valuable also. Then there's audio data. Maybe the machine operator tells me, typically, before the machine breaks, there is this low sound or something, or there's a high-pitched sound or something. And if you know that, you place an audio sensor, you capture the signal, and then you can actually use that in the predictions as well. There can be image data. It's, for example, used a lot in quality prediction for the products. You observe the product while it's being produced. And if you see a defect early on, you can cut all the later steps. You save the money for that, because the product will be broken anyway at the end. Um, Okay, it happens in a lot of industries. I mentioned aviation and, and, and car industry. Uh, it's also, for example, in the energy production industry um, where you have wind turbines and the components of those turbines can also fail. Uh, obviously, depends on the stress that they're exposed to. Um, you have it in other manufacturing spaces like the cement industry, for example. Okay, the next use case is in the steel industry. We did a project there with uh, the world's largest steel producer. It's about predicting the quality of the product and if it's sufficiently good at the end of the process, but predicting it at the very first steps. Because sometimes the problem is introduced early on and only at the very end you clearly see it. But maybe if you had more data and better analytics techniques, maybe you can see it much earlier. And it turns out that's actually possible. So they can save a lot of money there by attacking the problem earlier in the process. So um, by looking at this, you have the, um, the melted steel in the beginning, and then you have, let's say, seven steps of rolling it, making it flatter and flatter. So it starts as something short and big, and then with every step, it gets thinner and longer. And then the question is, if I observe a certain quality problem at the end, which part does it correlate to in the beginning? Because obviously, it changed its shape. And also, could I have detected it in the uh, early parts of the process? Let me skip uh, a few slides there. Oops. Um, so another example is uh, also from the metal industry. If you um, have the liquid metal and you bring it into certain products, sometimes you do not only need the metal itself, like the ferrum, uh, the iron, but you need other ingredients on top of that to ensure certain um, quality aspects or properties of the product. Sometimes these extra ingredients are very expensive, and you don't want to use more of them than necessary. But also, you don't want to use too little, because then maybe you don't meet the quality criteria. And what machine learning can do is, from observations, if I had this mixture, that happened. If I had this mixture, that happened. You can actually generate models that you can use in simulation. What happens if I change these parameter settings? Can I expect the quality to be good enough? And you can actually reduce the cost by not putting more ingredients in than necessary, at the same time still ensuring the quality and, and, and uh, increasing product quality at the end. We have applications of that in the uh, metal industry, but also with um, other products, for example, with rubber-based products, for example, tires, and, and uh, um, ensuring certain properties, predicting certain properties, like how long will the product last, and will it have a good grip, and so on. Let me skip the text slide. Now, now everyone is talking about data. Let's say you have a factory, hundreds of machines. Each machine has 100 sensors, and each sensor delivers you data with a 100 hertz rate. That means 100 measurements per second. That's a lot of data, more than a human can probably process. And this is um, the control center of a factory or a power plant or whatever, where you have all this information theoretically available. But do you see the problem? Is everything OK in the factory? Maybe not. Maybe there on the right upper side, there was one little sensor that showed me something. I just didn't see it. So the problem is big data can actually be overwhelming. So the idea is, can machine learning also help me to focus on where something critical is happening. This example is for the, uh, the factories. Um, but the same is actually true in intensive care medicine. You have hundreds of measurements for the patient. And it would be good if the system could actually help me to look where it's really critical to look at. In this case, it's a project in the chemical industry with companies like BASF and uh, INEOS and PCK. It's about um, developing products where problems can occur, and I want to detect these issues in the production process as quickly as possible so I can fix them as quickly as possible. Or if I learn more about them, 
then in the ideal case, like in predictive maintenance, predicts the situation and prevent it from happening. But if it has happened, it's also important to, to know what should I do. And what the system can then do is to basically look at the data from the past and see, did I have similar situations in the past? What did I do then? And did it help? And then you can present this information to the operator of the machines uh, or the control center and see, hey, in the past we had a similar problem. This is what you did, and this is the outcome. And this is in a decision support where the human can then decide, yeah, this would also apply here as a similar situation. Or the human would know something that's not in the data, but that he knows from his experience, well, this is not applicable here because this and that is different. Um, but it's a, it's a way to actually um, empower the, the user of the machine to a much higher degree, make more knowledge available to them quicker. What's relevant gives them the context so they can understand it. Um, the interesting thing, again, is it's not just sensor data. It's also textual data, for example, the logbooks from the operators of the machines. It's textual information from guidelines. What should you do typically in a situation with that problem? It's um, information from the lab. It's information from the production. It's information about the products. It's information about how the machines and, and the conduction uh, the production process are configured, and all of that can have an influence on if something is going wrong or not. And then uh, is also information that helps me to predict critical situations or to detect them very fast. Another example, um, together with Daimler, um, Daimler Trucks more precisely, um, they manufacture machines for trucks um, and buses. And Miele, they manufacture white goods like washing machines and dryers. And um, they have the problem that the market wants to have more and more variations of the models in ever shorter cycles. The problem is it's quite a costly product, a process to design a new product, to set up the assembly lines, and so on, and to make sure this is still a profitable business if, if you have more and more variations to do in ever shorter times. And the typical situation is the product designer comes up with a product design, then gives the design to the assembly planner, and then the assembly planner has to figure out how to assemble this thing, and then realizes oh, the way this is designed makes the assembly very complicated. I have to reach like this and then do this. So it will cost a lot of time, and it means a lot of money to actually assemble it this way. And he goes back to the product designer and asks him if he can change that. And the product designer says, sure, I can. And then he makes a new design, gives it to the planner, and they iterate a few times until both the design and the assembly are good. Now the idea for that project was, what if I could predict the assembly time for each new design? So the designer hasn't do the iteration with the assembly planner, but can come up with the right design directly. So if you have different design options, you can see for each option what would actually be the effort and cost of, of assembling that. Um, so that was the challenge. How do I do that? It's a complex input. I have a complete 3D design, maybe thousands of parts in that design. And on the other side, I want to predict an assembly plan. Uh, it's a non-trivial task, obviously. But if you can solve it, you have a lot of advantages. And uh, maybe let me just uh, explain that a little bit um, in this example. You have seen the different engines from the past. And now you have a new design for which you need to assemble a new plan. The thing is, you have seen for each design in the past what was the matching assembly plan. And now you can try to find similar designs from the past. And if you take multiple similar designs from the past, you can see what do these assembly plans have in common? And they use that information actually to see, oh, OK, this should probably also be part of my new design. And you see where the variations is. And similar to a Google search, we do not just produce one assembly plan there, but it's like a, a rank list of most likely appropriate assembly plans and also the estimated assembly time. So this way, you don't have to iterate anymore between the product design and the assembly planner. The product designer immediately knows how much effort this design would cost, and then he can choose the best alternative. And also for the assembly planner, life becomes much easier, because what's already standard is already, designed, uh, is already planned by the system. And only where the expert knows better or has a better idea how to do it or has more experience, only then he needs to manually change the assembly plan or um, optimize it. So they both can work much more e efficient and, and at a much lower cost per new product design. And this means smaller series of products are still profitable doing that. And also, it means the process is much faster, because I don't have to iterate anymore. It means the whole planning process can be at lower cost and at faster speeds, which makes the company much more agile and reacting to new demands on the market. Another examples I already mentioned in predictive maintenance is a lot of value in text. 
Now let's look at another business. Everyone knows PayPal, the online payment service provider. The thing is, they have a lot of customers in a lot of countries, and some of them are not so happy, so they complain. They do that by writing an email, filling out a web form, um, or filing a complaint. The, the problem is it's hundreds of thousands of texts every year, and nobody has the time to really read all of them. So the, the goal here was that the um, machine learning algorithms analyze the text, find the common topics, find, first of all, which customer feedback is positive, which is negative, what's the sentiment, how likely are they to churn to use another service provider instead of PayPal, and we build a system that automatically scans all their text messages, uh, the feedback messages, in more than 30 languages and automatically extracts what are the most frequent topics, what are the most annoying topics, what are those topics that make customers churn. And then they, as a result, they get a, uh, in, in almost real time, continuously updated list of what are the top 20 issues our service needs to become better at or what are the technical problems we need to fix so that the customers are satisfied and they don't run away. It's a lot of value in text data, obviously. Similarly, um, Along with text, you also have a lot of information in image data. If you think about patents, there is a high value in, in analyzing patents automatically to find out is there a new technology that's valuable, valuable for my company or are other people using my patents without telling me. So there's various uses of that um, where you use both text data and image data. I have a few more use cases, but I think I'll, well, maybe a few more. Um, this one is about streaming data. Um, if the TV makers better understand their audience and what they like and dislike, obviously they can optimize their program and they can also tell the advertisers who actually sponsor the program um, when the right audience is watching what channel. In Germany, this is done typically, you pick a sample, a few hundred, maybe a few thousand viewers, they have a little box on the TV and you just monitor when they switch from one channel to another. Nowadays, in the days of streaming TV, it's an IT process anyway, so basically you don't have to use a sample. You can, theoretically monitor everyone in real time. That's what we did in this project with um, BBC, Zatu, and others. It's about monitoring all viewers in real time. And anonymously, we're not interested in about a single person, and we don't want to break data protection there. It's more about, if I look at a certain group, the people, let's say young males between 20 and 25, what are they watching now? Or when do I reach them if I want to place an advertisement? And you see in real time, what are they watching? Or when are they switching? Is the moderator of the show doing a lame joke? OK, they're switching. Or is the explanation too long? They're getting bored. Or what's really clicking with the viewers? And when can I find which group where? So it's a nice example of having large volumes of data in real time and getting insight and, and uh, information from that in real time. Let me skip a few more. One or two words on what we do. As I said, we are the software provider behind all these use cases. It's a software like a Lego toolbox. You have building blocks, you have hundreds of machine learning algorithms, you have data connectors to all types of data, like databases, flat files, images, audio data, and so on. Um, and this system allows you to ingest the data, process it, do the modeling, do the validation of the models, up to the deployment. It covers basically all stages. The core product is um, a visual user interface. There's a, service, a server version for automation with process uh, schedulers and so on. Um, you can integrate with other tools. We just skip those and come to another thing. I introduced a lot of use cases today. What I would like to do now is introduce to you um, an initiative of the German government to actually make people more aware of what machine learning can do for both companies as well as society overall, like, for example, in, in healthcare or in, in government and administration, but obviously also what can companies benefit to educate people better of what's possible, to have a discussion about the ethics behind it, what's okay, what's not okay to do, um, and to promote that. And um, this uh, initiative is called Platform Lernen des Systeme in German. So it's, it's about learning as in, as in the sense of machine learning. And uh, it's structured in, in seven working groups, some of which are more focused on infrastructure, for example, or on ethics, uh, while the others are more focused on particular use cases, like mobility. Everybody knows about self-driving cars, or about industry use of, of uh, data mining, and so on. And the idea is Germany is already very strong in manufacturing. Germany is also very good in the theoretical research about machine learning. And now we want to bring this together and actually bring this on the road, make companies 
leverage what's possible with machine learning, make society understand what's possible, to not only see the risks and fears, but also see the potentials, and then have the discussion, what do we want as a society, um, and what do we not want? What should be allowed, what should be promoted, and what should be maybe forbidden? Um, and how do we want to design systems to make sure the self-driving car behaves in the way we want it to behave? Or if you think of other uses, for example, robots that you want to have for uh, critical situations. If the ho house is on fire, you don't want to risk another life by sending a person in. But uh, you can still save a, a, a human by sending in a robot. Same for a nuclear power plant. If there's an accident, maybe you don't want to send in a human, but a robot could help there, and so on. So there's a lot of scenarios where machine learning and, and AI can obviously help a lot. And uh, this platform has a goal to promote that, to also lead the discourse and discussion in this arena. So now we have a little bit of time left for questions, if you have any. No questions. Thank you very much.